So, apparently the skeptical community has been challenged by vegans. Now, at first I found this a little odd. How do you pose an intellectual challenge to a community that don't, by and large, claim to know anything? It has since been brought to my attention that there is also a skeptical community on YouTube. Now, unfortunately, and in spite of my best efforts, I've been unable to locate even a single YouTube skeptic. So please, if you know where I can find any, do share. Right now, I'm more disposed to believe in Bigfoot, who, somewhat surprisingly, has more video evidence pointing in his favour. I did find a lot of people with sceptical, logical, or rational such and such, unimaginatively worked into their names. Some of them are even talking about veganism, so maybe I'm on the right track. You know, these YouTube skeptics outperform traditional skeptics in one way. The traditional skeptic is thought to only claim to know nothing. But these guys make good on the claim. But enough about them. What's this about a challenge? Well, a YouTuber called Ask Yourself made a five minute video placing an argument on screen while talking smack to the skeptical community. He's pictured here next to his compatriot and frequent debate partner, Vegan Gaines. Um, I really must apologize for this picture. Can you believe someone made that? Anyway, this elicited several response videos, which in turn prompted several live debates between Ask Yourself, his friend, and various skeptics. Recently, Ask Yourself has compiled some of the best moments into a video, so you can look at that to see just how much people have been struggling, if you don't believe me. Um, and although I've enjoyed watching the struggle, I think there are some problems worth pointing out with this argument. Of course, I'll first explain Ask Yourself's argument, then point out where I think it has difficulties. My aim is not to settle the debate between vegans and meat eaters, I'm just looking at Ask Yourself's argument. And I'm no expert, but there probably are better arguments for veganism out there. Um, Peter Singer probably has some, so if you are a meat eater, I'd suggest reading him before celebrating. One final point of clarification before we start. Um, I will be speaking of properties instead of traits. Now, what is a property? Well, in this case, it could be some biological or psychological feature of humans which differentiates them from animals. Or it could even be some abstract feature, so long as that does what we need it to. Basically, properties are a blank variable to be filled with anything we choose. Um, with this sort of generality, we can just look at the logic of the issue and remove unnecessary sides over what traits are or which ones are eligible. And it also allows us to include, uh, as targets of the argument, uh, people with non-naturalistic inclinations, like divine command theorists or Platonists, against whom we don't simply want to beg the question. Um, and nor do we have to if we use properties. So, from here on, if you hear traits or features, assume them synonymous with properties. The argument you're looking at now is taken verbatim from Ask Yourself's video, which is linked below, so you can check for yourself whether or not I'm misrepresenting him in some way. Time well spent, I'm sure. It says, Premise 1, humans are of moral value. Premise 2, there is no trait absent in animals which, if absent in humans, would cause us to deem ourselves valueless. And conclusion three, therefore, without establishing the absence of such a trait in animals, we contradict ourselves by deeming animals valueless. Now, the first thing of note to my mind about premise one um, is that it is normative, meaning it makes an ethical claim, a claim about values. And this is pretty much par for the course in ethical argumentation. Usually the normative premise is one the arguer expects wide agreement on. Using normative premises allows us to argue with others about ethics without having to establish some prior standard we both agree to, so long as we both accept the normative premise. The presumption here is that only moral nihilists, or people who don't think there's any such thing as moral value, will deny premise one. Um, at that point, having an ethical debate about value attribution would be quite pointless. Now, this leaves swathes of intuitive believers in human value, but not necessarily in non-human animal value as the targets of the argument. Actually, for convenience hereafter, the word animal will be used to refer to only non-human animals. Of course, I'm aware humans are animals, um, so consider yourselves preempted in the comments. There isn't too much more to say about premise 1 just yet, so we'll move on to premise 2. The second premise, being the important one, or at least the one expected to be contentious, should be considered carefully. What is it we're being asked to assent to, and why should we? Um, loosely, it seems to me that premise 2 asserts that no property exists which fills a certain role, that being to attribute moral worth to humans, um, but not animals. And this can be cashed out pretty precisely 
We're looking for some property which applies to humans and not animals, and which, if applied to animals, would warrant extending moral consideration to them. Um, and the removal of that property from humans must warrant the withdrawal of moral consideration from said human. Um, I understand there being some confusion around this premise, because it's worded with like three negations and one conditional. Um, if you want to see someone really struggle to make sense of this, I'd recommend No Bullshit's video on the matter. Um, though I imagine he struggles with most sentences, so perhaps it's not the vegan's fault. Wait, what? An intellectual litmus test? Schism in the skeptic sphere? Dude, I gotta get out a dictionary just to figure out what the fuck he's trying to say. And I'm pretty smart. I know some people might comment I'm not smart enough to understand him, but that's not it. He just speaks in overly complicated, convoluted language. He's fucking confusing. But I looked over it a few times, so let me try and be the autistic translator for you guys. Basically, ask yourself as saying, if you're not a vegan, you're not intellectually honest, and I think that's total fucking bullshit. Look at P2 on this loser's little chart. There's no trait absent in animals, which if absent in humans, would cause us to deem ourselves valueless. Wow, more confusing, convoluted language. His points are very overcomplicated, especially for like a five minute YouTube video. I guess that's the only way he can win these little arguments he has, by confusing people with convoluted phrasing and getting them to fall for his false assumptions. But we'll get to those false assumptions later. For now, let's talk about traits that animals don't have. We'll skip that other weird part where he puts an if in there to try to mess you up. Now, there is a lot going on in this premise, um, and a few presuppositions taking place um, that I won't discuss right at this moment, uh, nor will I discuss the argument which is intended to defend this premise. Uh, for now, I simply want to explain the argument in a way that might make sense to people with no bullshit's level of literacy. So we'll move on to the conclusion. The simple way of reading the conclusion, to my mind, is as saying the following. If premise two is true, then it's not the case that animals do not have moral value. Or, if you speak like a regular person, animals have moral value. You might think I'm taking liberties, since he didn't actually make that claim. Um, instead, he only claims it would be contradictory to assert a difference where none exists. But, to say that some proposition P is contradictory is to say that P is false everywhere and always. And it also says the negation of P is a logical truth, that is, a tautology. So, if it's everywhere and always false to assert that animals do not have moral value, then the negation of that uh, must be everywhere true. Uh, the two are logically equivalent. Thus, we can phrase the conclusion either as saying to deny animals value is contradictory or that animals have value. The other interesting thing about ending an argument with a contradiction is that it implies one or more of the premises must be abandoned in order to maintain consistency, which is exactly how the vegans present the consequences of their argument. So rather than saying they've proven animal value, uh, the vegan says that unless one can answer the challenge posed by premise 2, denying animal value comes at the cost of consistency. Now, one may well wonder uh, what the difference between these two formulations of the conclusion is, given that they're logically equivalent. Um, and if there is any advantage in the difference, then I imagine it comes by way of a sort of burden shift. Um, rather than having to defend premise 2, the vegan puts their interlocutor in the position of having to uh, show premise 2's falsity. Now, this is speculative on my part. I don't claim to know the intention is to distract or unfairly confound the opponent. However, concluding that your opponent's view is inconsistent, rather than that your own view is correct, puts the challenge to them to remove the alleged inconsistency, rather than to you to support the claim made. Again, uh, I'm not claiming this is a conscious tactic employed by the vegan. I have no idea whether it is or not, and no reason to think so. However, it is what happens in most of the debates I've seen on the matter, and it does put the opponent on the defensive when they have no more reason to be than the vegan. Uh, don't get me wrong, burden shifting is nonsense, and no one should care about it, whatever. Both parties in this debate, and any debate, have their burdens to bear. Um, the vegan must support the argument, however they choose to formulate it, and the non-vegan must find ways of rejecting it, however it's formulated. But, all too often, I've seen the vegan sort of sit back and pretend the only thing they need to do is offer rebuttals to their opponent's efforts, and, and that's not so. To briefly recap then, we said that Ask Yourself's conclusion is a contradiction, and that means he must be trying to get us to reject one or other of the premises that led us to it. In this case, the idea is that we cannot jointly maintain these three premises. One, humans have value. 
two, there is no property which plays the role we described above, and three, that animals have no moral value. Um, rejecting one implies moral nihilism, while rejecting three implies veganism. Um, but what about two? Well, rejecting two seems to require showing the existence of some property in virtue of which humans have value and animals do not. Uh, this is where the argument gets its moniker, named the trait, because it is assumed this is what must be done to avoid either of the first two outcomes and reject two. Whenever we analyze a logical argument, the first thing we ask is if it is valid. And, of course, there is disagreement on the appropriate way to think about validity and when we should count an inference or chain thereof as valid, but these questions aren't really of interest to us. Um, all I'll mean by validity is the standard or common view that a valid argument is truth-preserving. Uh, that is, uh, if an argument is valid, the truth of its premises will logically entail the truth of its conclusion. And conversely, an argument whose premises do not entail their conclusion uh, is counted invalid. Now, beware the distinction here between validity and truth. Arguments may be invalid in not securing their conclusion while still having true premises and a true conclusion. So don't be led into thinking that just because an argument is invalid, the conclusion is necessarily false. It, it may well have a true conclusion. Um, now that the notion of validity should be clear to you, we can ask if this argument is valid. Um, and the simplest and quickest way of testing for validity, which you can all apply yourselves without any logical training, is just to ask whether it's possible for all the premises of the argument to be true and yet the conclusion to be false without contradicting ourselves. And the way this argument is formulated, um, it is possible. So consider the case in which humans are morally valuable but animals are not, and this is not due to some single property differing between them. It may be that moral value does not reside in some single property or even in any properties at all. Uh, basically the first premise entails that humans just have moral value but not in virtue of having some specific property or set of properties. Um, but there is no corresponding premise for the animal case, and including one would beg the question at hand. Another way of looking at the problem is by asking yourself, uh, well what reason is there for thinking the role we described above must be fulfilled by a single trait or property? If it does not, for either of the aforementioned reasons, then the argument fails. So we need an, either an argument that value really does work that way, and only that way, or, failing that, a rephrasing of the argument which can avoid the problem. If we try addressing the first complaint, that there may be multiple properties which bestow moral value, or that the latter might depend on some combination of properties, then the vegan must reformulate both premise 2 and the argument intended to support it, that being the challenge to name the trait or uh, traits, as it would have to be. Now, of course, I think that challenge itself dubious for reasons I'll discuss shortly, but uh, let's address the second option first, since it promises to remove our unsightly logical gap between premises and conclusion rather more immediately. So, as I've said, there is a way of formulating the argument to avoid these problems, but we'll quickly see that new and worse ones loom. So, suppose instead the argument is premise one, humans are morally valuable, Premise two, there is no morally relevant difference between humans and animals. Premise three, for all x and all y, if x has moral value and y is not morally distinct from x, then y has moral value. And premise three here is just a standard transitivity clause. Um, to conclusion four, therefore animals are of moral value. Um, it's clear enough how this argument is intended to work. That is, it would be somewhat contradictory to deny animals value uh, assuming morality admits of some form of transitivity, meaning if A implies B and B implies C, then we can say that A implies C. Uh, now, assuming such things hold for moral discussion is perhaps not uncontroversial, but it is not really unreasonable either. Uh, in any case, I will not be disputing it here. But the next question is how to make sense of the idea that there is no morally relevant difference between animals and humans. Uh, more particularly, what do we mean when we say there is no such difference? Well, intuitively, if there is no moral difference between two things, then those two things are morally identical, right? Um, they're certainly strong enough to ensure validity in light of premise one. If humans are morally valuable and animals are morally identical, then animals are, of course, morally valuable too. But then we ought to be upfront about premise two and simply say humans and animals are morally identical. However, I expect to find far less agreement on this premise from non-vegans, since it pretty much gives the game away. Uh, moreover, if vegans could provide a substantial defense of this new and improved premise too, they probably would be better off hammering that point rather than making the current argument at all. Uh, my hunch is that this is telling. Comparison of both arguments will show that neither work, 
The original is invalid, and the reformulation valid but trivial. My suspicion is that confusion of the strength of the relevant premise gives the argument more traction than it ought to get. So if one is clear and precise, the argument is either logically invalid or uh, redundant. Um, let's leave the bigger logical picture to one side momentarily. Um, we said that premise 2 was contentious and required some further argumentation to support. What exactly is that argument? Well, uh, as far as I'm aware, the only defense offered is the vegan's challenge to name the trait, and the ensuing counterexamples given in response to any attempt at doing so. Uh, the problem is this, uh, even if we grant that the name the trait challenge has worked in every case so far, and make an inductive generalization that it will hold in all future cases, that still wouldn't establish the truth of premise 2, as originally given. Uh, the fact everyone debated by Ask Yourself has been unable to name such a property has little bearing on whether or not said property exists. Let's go back to Bigfoot for a moment. If I claim that Bigfoot doesn't exist, and you ask how I know that, it would be quite strange if I turn around and ask you to prove to me that he does exist, then when you can't or won't declare that I've proven him not to exist. Of course, if Bigfoot does not exist, then it will be impossible to prove that he does. Um, nonetheless, the inability of all question to do so does not logically entail his non-existence. Basically, even if we wholeheartedly accept the name the trait challenge, it still wouldn't necessarily entail the truth of premise 2. Uh, so the trait argument, even if totally successful, doesn't actually do the job it's supposed to. Alright, this video is already getting quite lengthy, and I have quite a bit more to say, but rather than trying to cram all that into 5 minutes, I've decided to break this into two parts. You can expect the second about this time next week, assuming I find the time. Here is, I think, the most natural point for an intermission. The preceding sections posed some rather substantial threats to the efficacy of the vegan argument, and the next episode will provide a closer look at Name the Trait uh, using concrete examples. Uh, we will also deal with some other options like agnosticism and give some additional support to the multi-property approach deployed here.